Hi, everyone. Welcome to my RSA 365 talk called When Application Security the Wrong Way is the Right Thing for Your Organization. My name is Jennifer Chapleski. I'm the Director of Product Security for Target Corporation. And today we're going to talk about some myths in the application security space and ways that Target went a different direction and busted those myths. This is a bit of a reprisal from a talk that I gave at RSA when we were in person in February of 2020. And following this talk will be a moderated Q&A with Caroline Wong, who's head of strategy and HR at Cobalt IO. So before we get into some myth busting, let's back up and just talk a little bit about Target and our IT environments. So Target is a Fortune 30 retailer. We are based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is where I'm coming to you from today. Uh, we have 350,000 team members across the world. Our stores are in the US, but we have team members really across the globe. And if you shop at a Target store, you might know some of these things about Target. But what you might not know about Target is how critical technology has become to our daily operations. Things like order pickup or drive up or paying with your app using the Target uh, mobile wallet or our partnership with Shipt for same day delivery. All of those things weren't uh, sort of decided by some folks who are working in business roles and thrown over the wall to the IT team. Our IT team partners with our business team members every day to come up with innovative ways that Target can best serve our guests. And in order to be that really valuable and skilled partner for Target's business teams, our IT organization went through a pretty significant transformation in 2015. Prior to our transformation, we were a really project heavy, vendor heavy, contractor heavy organization. And in our transformation, we adopted the product methodology, agile and DevOps delivery mechanisms. We brought in a lot of engineering talent um, and started developing a lot of what we use every day in house. And in order to make that work, we really had to focus on innovation and skill development. So at Target, we have a program called 50 Days of Learning, and it's basically a literal title. Every IT team member is expected to spend 50 days a year or about one day a week developing and enhancing and building new and continuing to develop their IT skills to be that valued partner with our business teams. So now that you know a little bit about Target and you know a little bit about how our IT operation runs, Let's get to myth busting. And the first myth that we'll be talking about is that there's no single metric to measure application security. So I've been in an application security role for five years, and I've heard this myth quite a few different times while I've been working in AppSec. And it's an interesting question. How do we help teams understand their security posture? Some options that I've uh, seen at different organizations are security test coverage. So what coverage of uh, tests do we have on our applications or on the code that we have? People have thought about using defects, security defects per lines of code. Uh, we've at Target adopted uh, historically how fast teams are resolving security issues and that worked um, for a while on some of the ways that we were able to incentivize teams to think more seriously about security. But all of those things require you to really understand a lot of things outside just the security of your application. And so we thought, is there a way that we can better serve our IT partners with how to measure application security? So in 2017, we launched a system called Product Intelligence. And Product Intelligence pulls a lot of different security data together. And the first thing that you'll notice when you log into the Product Intelligence system is that it gives a product team a single number. This number ranges uh, on the low end from 300 to the highest it can be is 850. And that scale mimics the same scale that you would see in like a personal credit score. But really the scale between the uh, low and high end numbers for the credit score is where we differ uh, from a personal credit score with this product intelligence score. We are very transparent, every single element, every single point is very clear to product teams for uh, what makes up their score. So this is a fake product. If you zoom in, you can see that this product is called Fakeosaurus Rex. We don't have a product at Target called Fakeosaurus Rex, though we might someday. And Fakeosaurus Rex with the fake data that we've plugged in here has a 751. So what's very easy for a product team to understand is in summary, how am I doing from a product security perspective? And this number uh, is made up of four different categories. 
The first category, so the range between 300 and 850, the first um, grouping is called findings and vulnerabilities. And that makes up 45% of the score. What we measure in the findings and vulnerability space is not how many findings you have or how many vulnerabilities you have. What we measure is for each of the findings and vulnerabilities that products have, are they meeting the commitments that the team committed to for closing those findings or addressing those vulnerabilities? So if you have 10 findings and you've closed nine of them on time, then you get a 90% for this uh, findings and vulnerability category, and you're probably going to have a pretty high score for that section. So the first category, findings and vulnerabilities, measures uh, are they closing findings according to the schedule that the product teams themselves set. The second category at 35% is security services. And what we measure here is, are you using the security services that the security team has deemed important? For example, if you have uh, findings from a pen test, that's 45% of your findings or 45% of your score, but we really wanna make sure that teams don't avoid the pen test entirely. So 35% of it is, are you doing the pen test that you need to? Are you filling out the risk register and using those security services that are important for the security of products. The last 20% uh, of the score is split evenly between security culture, which makes up 10% and essentially measures our product teams doing the cultural things that we want them to do to have good software security. And in this case, do you have a security ninja and uh, is your ninja doing the things that we want the ninjas to do? And lastly, sort of the ultimate measure of any um, application security posture, has you, have you been the root cause of a security event or incident in the last 12 months? So the score uh, 751 kind of measures all of those things. And that's an important um, tool for different every, everyone to have sort of clear information about how they stand. But what's incredibly important and the most important secret sauce of this system is the actions to take. We don't just tell teams you're 751 and here's all of the ways that that was made up, but we tell them for 39 more points, uh, there's some scope in your uh, particular application that hasn't been pen tested. You have 26 points that you could gain by closing some security findings. You have some critical uh, endpoint vulnerabilities that need to be addressed. So this specific actions to take is where we really empower teams to take the steps to better improve the security of their product. Uh, some other elements that you might notice on the score is the relativity. So we also show teams, here's 751, here's the actions, but here's how you compare to other products at Target. And this one has been um, really powerful to have good conversations. When we launched this system in 2017, I sat down with a peer and walked her through, you know, here's your system and you're at a 650 and here's the actions you should take. And she was, yep, sounds good. But when we talked about the product rank, and at that time, this product was in the bottom 10% of all products, the conversation changed. And she's like, oh, that can't be true. We take security very seriously. And it allowed me to have a really good conversation about how we actually consider and measure security. So this relativity is good for all of us type A folks who feel strongly about being in the top 20 or 10% compared to other products. And the last uh, information that you can see on the first page is the historical trend. We want to compare teams not only to everyone else, but to themselves. And it's not uncommon when we're in the office, um, though we aren't currently, to walk around the floors and see different teams sort of talking about the trends of their pie score on their team whiteboards and celebrating when they've uh, kind of hit thresholds that they're trying to do. So this is the main page. As you continue to go through the system, I've mentioned transparency and that's in a really important element. In order for people to trust that this data is accurate and that they should take the actions that we are asking them to, we give them every element, every source data, we show them everything about their system so that they can see uh, what they need to do and kind of in context of all of the other things. But one of the things that we're also trying to do is not just require our product team counterparts to go to the system all the time and pull down information. We try to meet teams where they work. So we offer integrations with GitHub and JIRA backlogs, as well as email notifications. People can sign up and be notified when certain things change about the score. Um, and uh, they can download all of the findings or the actions that they need to take into their team backlogs so they can prioritize security work alongside all of the other uh, features and functions that they're trying to offer. When I see all of this data together for Fagosaurus Rex, it's really helpful to see everything together. But let me just kind of rewind and paint for you all what it was like before we had a system like this. 
So prior to 2017, we had entire teams of security analysts whose job was to go into the GRC system on a weekly or monthly basis, pull all of the information out, consolidate it into spreadsheets, send those spreadsheets over to the teams, go back and forth with them about actions that needed to be taken. And we said for years and, and believed then that product teams are responsible and accountable for the security of their products. But in reality, they couldn't get to any of the data. They really had to work through the security team to make a lot of changes. So in reality, we created a system where the security team had more accountability than the product team. And that's been a really big shift with this system, the ability for product teams to take accountability for the security of their products. Not too long after we launched the product view, the leaders of those particular systems asked for summarized information. And that's been really helpful as well to drive changes within our teams. So not only can leaders see the scores for the different systems that they're responsible for, but they can also see trend information. How are we doing on pen testing? How are we doing on um, endpoint vulnerabilities? We have sections that talk about security coding flaws that happen within their portfolios. And we've been able to target each um, kind of portfolio or teams with specific training opportunities based on trends that they see in the, um, in the different sections here. And it's just been really valuable to, again, put that accountability back into teams and they can make some decisions about where they want to invest. It also lets leaders understand sort of over time, how are we doing? Are we better or worse than we were three months ago, six months ago? So if any of this sounds interesting and you wanted to build something like this within your own organization, when we started, we had two or three folks working on the system. Um, we have more now, but when we started, we kind of started small and we had just a few people working on it. We used open source technology as much as possible. So the screenshots that I was showing earlier, those are a product called Superset, which is an open source technology that you can use for um, tables and graphing. And we rely primarily on source systems to give us data. So we connect via API to all these different source systems. And then the secret sauce of the product intelligence system is kind of putting that information together so a product team can see it and really translating all of that to actions that we want folks to take. From a prerequisites perspective, some things that we had to get in place before we were able to take this step with product intelligence was at least a basic understanding of the assets that you have uh, what systems, what software do you have, and pulling that information together. Uh, policy was really helpful. So nothing in the product intelligence system is new. It's all things that are already included in the security policy. We're just being more transparent about um, what we expect of product teams to do. So we're pulling that together um, for them to look at. And last, you can have all of the numbers and the actions and the things um, that you can pull together but without a lot of commitment from the organization, it's just another metric. From our CIO on down, the PI score, the PI actions are something that teams care about and their leaders care about and we talk about on a regular basis. All right, we're going to bust another myth and that is to welcome any and all engineers to a security guild, better still mandate participation. So why is this concept even important? Well, at Target, we have 4,500 developers spanning across 200 product teams. And our security team needed to find a way to be everywhere at once. And so looking at the industry, there's lots of organizations that have programs like this. They could be called security champions or advocates or security ninjas. That's the term that we landed on for our program. But where our program differs from other programs that you might see is that ours is not a tiered system for learning where everyone participates and you start as a lower belt and kind of move your way up the program. Our hypothesis in 2016 is that if we created a program that was exclusive and somewhat prestigious, we could get the right people who are going to be the most engaged and could have the better chance to actually permeate the culture of the organization. We landed on the term security ninjas because who we're looking for in this program are people who are nimble and at the top of their game. And the thought when we launched the program and has proven true is that with a smaller group, we can create a more curated program. We can be more transparent about the security threats that we're facing. We can have uh, more meaningful trainings and offer better swag, t-shirts, IT tchotchkes that can go on your desk. So let's talk a little bit about Target's exclusive security ninja program. 
So we are looking for participants in the program that are seasoned, influential, and passionate. And what we really mean here are the, indiv the individuals that are influential. When they talk, their team listens. Um, we also want folks who are passionate about security and want to be here. At my organization, we have this concept of being voluntold. I personally have been voluntold for a great many things over the years, and we don't want anybody who's voluntold to be in this program. We want you to be excited and to really want to make a difference in the security posture of your team's product. Uh, the program itself, I've mentioned, exclusive. Um, we've set a ceiling that no more than 5% of the tech population can be part of the program. So at 4,500 people, that's about 225 ninjas at any time. We're currently at 170, so we're still underneath that ceiling. Uh, their primary goal is to build security awareness and excitement within their teams. And what the program has actually become, uh, even though we didn't set out to make this, is that it's been an accidental talent pipeline for the security organization. Every year in the five years that we've had this program, between five and eight people who are developers in product teams get so excited and so interested in the security work that we're doing, they leave their development teams and join the security team. Uh, so that's been very exciting in a world where security talent is so hard to find, to have created this accidental talent pipeline was exciting and surprising for us. So what does it mean to be a security ninja? That first means that if you're an extension of the security team, we'd at least like you to have some basic security knowledge. So the first responsibility is to build and then maintain that security knowledge. The second responsibility and probably the largest element of being a security ninja is to guide your teams in security best practice. So don't just take in a bunch of information, but really use that information that you've learned to guide your teams in doing things in the most secure possible way. Uh, a very small but important element of the Security Ninja program is to maintain the application inventory data. That usually just means nudging teams to populate the risk register. And the last element that's very important for us is that they are a voice of customer for the InfoSec team. Our security ninjas know what we're trying to do, but they sit organizationally with their product teams. And so they can help us gauge whether or not the things that we're trying to do actually um, are landing the way that we think they are. They give us really great input on ways that we can improve the services that we offer. Ninjas agree when they join the program to spend about 20% of their time doing these things. And as I've mentioned, we consider them an extension, an extension of the security team. They are absolutely empowered to make security decisions within their teams as long as they don't violate security policy. And these are the basic four things that all the security ninjas, all 170 people have agreed to do. But what we've seen is because we've chosen people who are very engaged, very passionate, the right folks who really wanna be here is that they go above and beyond this list so many times. In the last 12 months, we have Ryan, he's a ninja in our point of sale system, who recognized that our uh, static scanner, our SAST system, was not covering languages that they used for some of the functionality in our point of sale system. So he researched and implemented an augmentation that we then plugged into our static scanner that covered languages that they used within our point of sale. We have Mohit in our Bangalore office who liked what we were doing with product intelligence, but recognized that it might not cover all of the things that he wanted to measure for the systems that he was responsible for. So he added an entire like augmentation library of things that he wanted to also be looking at in terms of measurements for the systems that he was responsible for. These are two examples, but we see our ninjas doing stuff like this all the time. And that's how we're really excited to have those right individuals who really wanna be here and make meaningful change in the org. So what does it mean to um, have that knowledge development? We do want people to be making informed decisions when they're out doing that. And the first thing is when you um, are nominated by your leader and then accepted to come into the program, you start with initial onboarding. And that usually is 90 minutes of security fundamentals followed by a three hour hands-on hacking course where we use an, uh, an intentionally vulnerable web app that you can get from many open source, um, like the OWASP juice shop is what we use. And we walk them through um, some of the ways that vulnerable websites can actually have an impact to the organization. And we see that that hands-on hacking class really helps people understand not just conceptually and sort of from a book, what a SQL injection or cross-site scripting is, but it really translates those types of flaws into actual web development. 
Once they complete initial onboarding, then we don't just train them and never see them again. We do monthly information sharing. That could be um, meetings where we come together and we do deep dives on certain topics. It could be you know, really continual chat ops that we have um, a private Slack room for our security ninjas to ask questions of each other. Uh, we've recently started issuing a newsletter that outlines things that we want ninjas to know, but more importantly, identifying actions and things that we want them to do. One of the questions that we always ask ourselves is, is this just information that's interesting or are there specific actions that we want our ninjas to take or our security teams to take, sorry, our product teams to take knowing that information. So um, in addition to the monthly information sharing, we also offer quarterly hands-on events. Our security ninjas have told us that they learn best from hands-on learning. And so we try every quarter to offer some kind of quarterly hands-on event where they can either come together or individually work through some challenges or different things. And lastly, for those individuals who just continually show us that they can do more, they want to do more, they're very engaged. When you join the program, we have a tiered system and um, everyone who joins comes in as a white belt. But then as you are able to make some meaningful change, show some projects and some ways that you've um, gone above and beyond, we have opportunities for folks on the program to become purple belts and even black belts. So we know that people who are in the program enjoy being in the program, uh, but the impact is really where we are excited about what this program has brought. In terms of enjoying the program, we uh, survey our ninjas every year uh, with uh, questions about what they like and don't like, and it's kind of end that with a net promoter score question. Net promoter score is essentially a scale between minus 100 and plus 100, and everybody just chooses a number. It takes out people who are sort of neutral and gauges who really cares about this thing. And the NPS, the net promoter score for the Security Ninja program last year was a plus 49. For some context, a plus 49 is also the net promoter score for iPhones. So people like their iPhone about as much as they like being a ninja, which to me seems like a pretty high bar. We also hear anecdotally from the ninjas that it's hard to leave the program. Um, they, when they're offered opportunities in other teams and target, they're hesitant to take those jobs if it means they have to give up their role as security ninja. Um, but we also hear from the teams that these ninjas participate with and sit on and influence that the teams and the leaders of those teams also really think that they're helping change the culture. Some of the quotes that you can see from last year's survey, our ninjas tell us that their team cares more about security than, and they've done a better job considering security early. Um, the product teams tell us that our ninjas influence team culture toward a security aware mindset. The leaders tell us that the way that our um, security, the way that our team thinks about security today is different. And my personal favorite quote is, uh, we have really skilled folks in the program who still have imposter syndrome. And the quote is that this program really helped me get over my imposter syndrome and realize I'm good at this, I can do this. Um, when we asked product teams collectively to rate the effectiveness of their security ninja, 79% of the respondents said that their security ninja was effective or very effective at changing the security culture and promoting that security culture within their teams. All right, the last myth that we'll be busting is around testing all of the things. The reason that this is an interesting one to me is in the security world, there are so many scary things that can exist. There are so many threats against your system and there's so many ways that things can go wrong. And it makes sense that if I were a product team, I would wanna know about all of those things and all of the ways that I could get better to make sure that those things that could go wrong, don't go wrong. And that was our hypothesis going into a, a system that we called Spotlight SAST. And our goal was to start with SAST and test all of the things, give teams a lot of information, really help them um, improve the security of their systems and be really transparent about what we're finding and what they needed to do. So we created the system and we made sure that it could scale for the size of code that we have and this pace in which we're checking in code and developing. We were very excited, we rolled it out and our product teams hated it. It was way too much information. It was way too hard for them to consume and prioritize. So let's back up a little bit and talk about what we were trying to do, what we did, and then why the myth that testing all the things maybe needed to be adjusted. When we started the system, um, our goal, as I said, was to improve the application security of all of our software systems by integrating SAST into engineering practices. 
we wanted to meet developers where they worked. We didn't want developers to stop developing and come over to the SAS system to either check in code or get their results. We wanted to offer end-to-end -end solutions. So not just finding issues, but giving them meaningful and helpful ways to solve those issues once they were found. And our goal always is to make the right way, the secure way of doing something, the easiest way for a product team to do it. And so even though we've learned a lot over the last three or four years of this journey, these are still the values that we're bringing today. So what is Spotlight SAST? This is just a screenshot that you can see of the system. And what it means is that it's an interface between our code management uh, technologies and the uh, static scanning or SAST technologies. Uh, it's meant to integrate these two things really easily so that within the code management technology teams can onboard to the um, SAS scans, they can get their results, and they can see everything that they need sort of in one place. Um, what we learned in our first iteration of the system were many things. What we launched um, in version one was um, all of the issues that were found, we hypothesized like teams are gonna to wanna to know about all of these and they're gonna to wanna to know about them individually so that they can address them individually. And what we ended up doing was just spamming teams with issues, sometimes dozen if not more dozens of issues being found within um, every scan that was run. We also made some assumptions about the kind of alerts that they wanted to have. For example, uh, when we hypothesized that when the system uh, ran but didn't find any issues, teams don't want to know about that. We should only tell them when there's a problem. But we also didn't tell them when the scan ran but failed for some reason. So a lot of times teams would run a scan and then not hear anything and be left to figure out on their own whether or not the scan was successful or if that no issues were found. So we did a really major overhaul about 18 months after we launched this system. We consolidated the way that we give information to teams so that it was easier to consume. And we really let them customize the way that they could get all of this information. If they wanted an email, they could choose that. If they wanted their information in GitHub issues or in JIRA stories, they could do that. Um, they could choose different ways to be notified when the system was performing or when scans were um, getting ready to be started. And so uh, the iteration of the system and the really listening to customers has made the second and subsequent versions a lot more successful. We still test all the things, but we only share information with teams um, that they've decided and that we've decided are meaningful. And it lets them kind of take a little bit more thoughtful look at actually what needs to be done and what maybe is a bit more noisy. So in the last five years, this is uh, the product security journey that this entire team has gone through has been very interesting. We've learned so much. We've tried to make meaningful change wherever we could. And when I think about the things that we've learned for these three systems that I've talked about in programs, but really in some of the other programs that we're running at Target as well, the lessons learned aren't all that different. First, iteration is key. Uh, I talked about that a lot with the Spotlight SAST system. Um, but you can start with an MVP and be willing and able to pivot, hear your customers kind of grow. We would really be um, much less successful than we have been today if we hadn't gone back and overhauled the system in the way that we did based on the customer feedback that we had with the Spotlight SaaS system. The second really important uh, lesson learned and thing that we continue to ask ourselves almost daily is what behavior do we want to drive? With every change to the PI score, product intelligence score, with every communication that we send to our security ninjas, it's just really asking ourselves, knowing is one thing, but what behavior do we want to drive with this particular change? And if we can't answer that question, then we really need to go back and say, is this something that we really want to ask our teams to do? The last one is a struggle for me because the security world is inherently complicated, but simplicity has been the key to our success. We have 4,500 developers. We have hundreds of product teams. Anything that's overly complicated has a really hard time being adopted. So with the product score, with the Security Ninja program, with the adjustments that we've made to Spotlight SAS, taking a step back and simplifying what we are giving to teams has really, really improved our ability to be successful. 
So thank you for listening for the last 30 or so minutes on uh, some of the things that we've done, some of the myths that we've busted in the product security team here at Target. Following this talk, I'll be joined by Caroline Wong, who is again, the chief strategist and HR head at Cobalt. And we'll be taking some of your questions. I think she has a few questions and we'll go a little deeper on these and lots of topics in the application security space. Thank you.